Welcome friends to the 8 Push Dig. Our topic today is to zoom in on a very specific period in US history, the early republic. We want to focus on the first two presidencies and examine the precedents they set. What stands out to me at this moment in history was the new conflict and ideas of political economy that quickly appeared at a time after the ratification of the new federal constitution where American leaders had hoped to count on order and unity in government. Let's begin with an overview of the Washington presidency. In one of his very first acts, and one of the first acts of Congress under the Constitution, the Judiciary Act was passed to give shape to the federal court system that had been left very vague in Article Three of the Constitution. Washington selected advisors to his first presidential <clears throat> cabinet. Alexander Hamilton would be Secretary of the Treasury, and Thomas Jefferson would be Secretary of State. An intense rivalry would soon erupt between these leaders and their followers. As President Washington would wage war against Native American tribes in the Ohio River Valley and in what is today the state of Indiana, as part of Hamilton's plan to raise revenue for the new nation's struggling funding stream, a tax was placed upon whiskey, which angered corn farmers and whiskey distillers in Pennsylvania, and they refused to pay the tax and organized an uprising. Advised to do so by Hamilton, Washington as president put back on his general's hat and commanded soldiers in the field to march against the whiskey rebels. The uprising was squashed, and Washington had demonstrated the authority of the new federal government against the states and groups that would not fall in line. At a time when warfare seemed perpetual on the European continent, Washington proclaimed neutrality and sought to keep the U.S. out of war between Britain and revolutionary France. This proclamation was reiterated in his farewell address, written at the end of Washington's second and final term as a warning to the U.S. In his farewell message, Washington also warned of the growing political factions he witnessed being birthed in the nation. Political leaders in the 1790s took a variety of positions on issues such as the relationship between the national government and the states, economic policy, foreign policy, and the balance between liberty and order. This led to the formation of political parties, the Federalists by Hamilton and the Democratic Republicans, usually just called Republicans and not at all related to the Republican Party of today, led by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. First, we'll examine the Federalists. Their strongest base of support could be found with the leaders who most fervently supported President Washington and greatly admired the strength of the new federal government under the Constitution. Geographically, the Federalist base was in the Northeast, most especially within the upper classes and the merchant class. Hamilton and the Federalists saw America's future as a commercial and manufacturing power. The U.S. economy needed to modernize, and the U.S. needed to maintain close economic ties to Britain. The challenge to the Federalist hold on power was led by Thomas Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans. Their base of support was in the South and in the expanding Western regions. They opposed the growing, strong, and centralized control the Federalists so praised. In contrast, the Republicans favored a weaker central government, which would allow states to make their own governing decisions. Where the Federalists wanted to interpret the Constitution loosely, which would allow the government almost unlimited power, the Republicans favored a strict interpretation of the Constitution, meaning a government which was solely limited to what was written plainly in the Constitution. Rather than a modernizing, manufacturing, and banking economy connected with Britain, the Republicans saw America's economic future as an agrarian one, a nation of small farmers stretching westward as far as one could imagine. After Washington's presidency came the first real contested election between two political parties. John Adams, the staunch Federalist, defeated Democratic-Republican Thomas Jefferson. John Adams' presidency was short and unremarkable. What stands out is the bitter partisan politics that was erupting, and the Federalists' authoritarian reaction to the Republican challenge. For example, in order to stifle dissent in the United States, Adams signed the Alien and Sedition Acts, which prohibited the criticizing of the government, a clear contradiction to the First Amendment freedom of the press. In the next election, Jefferson and the Republicans would emerge victorious, and the Federalist Party would slowly disappear over the next two decades. 
While the politicians were bickering in the halls of government, it's important to emphasize that in this period, slavery was expanding, and cotton became the number one agricultural commodity of the United States. The invention of the cotton gin made the planting and harvesting of cotton ultra-profitable and planted the bloody seeds for the cotton kingdom and the economic rule of King Cotton in the South for the next half century. With respect to the U.S.'s infant foreign policy stances, here's what is important to note. First, Washington and the policy of isolationism and neutrality. Tensions would arise in the U.S. from the conflict between Britain and France. The Federalists always favored Britain, the Republicans favored France, and this is true even with economic ties as well. The Jay Treaty aligned the U.S. closer to Britain. And later, there was friction in the waters with an undeclared naval war against France. War against Britain would soon come as well in 1812, so the neutrality and isolationism proved very difficult to adhere to. And finally, let's examine the economy of the United States in this early republic time period. Overwhelmingly, this is still an agricultural society. New York City and Philadelphia become the most important commercial centers, while slavery expands in the South, it is also declining in number in the North. The majority of Southern whites did not own any slaves, but those who did, and those who owned many, the planter class still dominated the political economy of the South. Hamilton's plan for the economy included the creation of a national bank. The first national bank was created during this time. And the Western lands offered new economic opportunities. It offered opportunities for farms, for small families, but the sale of Western lands was the main source of government revenue during this time. Finally, let's reflect on change during this time period. Differing visions for America's future divided early political leaders into rival groups. These factions then grew into the first political parties, mass political organizations, the Hamiltonian commercial-led elitist Federalists, and the Jeffersonian agrarian-led challengers, the Democratic Republicans. These competing visions for America's development the Hamiltonian versus the Jeffersonian, will continue to develop in conflict and unfold throughout the rest of the 19th century. But one vision will clearly win out. Can you guess who? We'll be discussing that later.